Chatters, good morning. L early birds, good morning. Good morning. Raven, good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, thanks for being here so early, unless you're EU, then thanks for being here, I guess. Uh, we are live at the Wolf Conservation Center today in New York. Um, this is Conservation Uncharted episode three. For those of you who don't know, which I assume most of you know that are here already, um, this is also, hi, I, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, this is a series that I started at the beginning of 2022. Um, and I did my first episode with whale and dolphin conservation in Monterey. We went whale watching and we looked at, um, we talked about North Atlantic right whales and killer whales and stuff like that. Uh, and then my second episode was in Ireland with birds of prey, bird of prey conservation. And my third episode, I've been planning this since the beginning of the year with Wolf Conservation Center, uh, is at the Wolf Conservation Center. I'm standing in front of an enclosure right now for Mexican gray wolves. You might see some of them run behind me. Um, and we are getting ready to go watch, uh, the staff here and some volunteers and a volunteer veterinarian do health checks. They're doing quarterly health checks on four wolves today. So we're going to see them up really close um, in a little bit, but I'm doing my intro right now. Um, a couple, a couple items to tell you guys about. So Wolf Conservation Center, uh, they're a nonprofit. Like any other Uncharted episode and any Conservation Cast episode, they were on my Conservation Cast, by the way. Uh, like any other episode, uh, this is a fundraiser for this organization. They're a nonprofit. Uh, they've been doing, they've been protecting wolves and advocating for wolves for over 20 years. Uh, they're one of the three largest facilities in North America that is protecting two of the most endangered mammals in North America. So they have Mexican gray wolves, which is behind me. In front of me, we'll go over there in a bit. They have red wolves. Um, there are about 130 Mexican gray wolves that are still in the wild uh, and about eight red wolves that still exist in the wild. So, um, Wolf Conservation Center is part of two species survival plans, a federal recovery and release program for these wolves, and they're doing super, super, super important work. So if you would like to donate to them today as a thank you uh, for letting us be behind the scenes, this is some really, really cool behind the scenes stuff that we're getting to do. The public is not here yet. Uh, nobody's here yet except for staff and me, and they've been so nice. Uh, so if you'd like to support them, I would really, really appreciate that. Um, Stealthy with $50, Wolf with $50, that, he said donating to myself for some reason. Excellent. Set range with $50. Thank you guys for the donations. Um, that is wonderful. Um, what else do I have to tell you? Other things that this center does. Uh, they do host public visitors. They do education programs. Um, their big things are, they're wolves. <laughs> their big things are education, um, education, advocacy, and that recovery and release. Um, so, they do school and scout educational programs. They do virtual programs. They have a Twitch channel. Uh, Mods, if you want to link their channel, they have live cams up. So if you don't see wolves, uh, if you want to see more wolves than you see on my stream this morning, you can look at their Twitch channel because they have live cams and they're like, Connor, Connor would be so jealous of their live cams here. They are no joke. Each enclosure has at least two. Um, I'm looking at them right now, but you can't see them. Or I can't find one that we can show you right now, but they're really good. So if you want to see their live cams, do that. Um, Matt with the $50, thank you so much. And Leonard with $25, thank you so much. That is wonderful. Thank you for linking it, Mick and Virtual and Gandhi. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I have to tell you guys right now. This facility in particular, uh, they have 32 wolves on this site. Uh, I think it's about, I think she said 50 acres. I think that's what she said. 
Um, so Mexican gray wolves, red wolves. I might be getting these last two wrong. I think they have eastern wolves. I don't know if they have coyotes on this facility. This is all that I've done from reading. I have not yet taken a tour of this facility. I know just about, okay, I know a little more than you guys do. <laughs> but about this facility itself, I have not done a walk around. This is like my first time seeing everything also. So we're gonna learn about it together. Um, but should be pretty cool. Siv with $50, Chubby Devil with $25, Super Duper Egg with $50, Vermins with $50, Satan with $50, Danza with $25. Thank you so much. And Anthony with $5. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, we are super lucky to, to be here today. They have been so kind. Um, again, I asked, I asked Regan, she's the director of education. We'll see, you'll see her in a bit about doing this episode at the beginning of the year. And she was like, Yes, she put me in Space's cameramaning today, by the way. Say hi, Space. Um, she put both of us in a hotel, um, and they've been wonderful. So I'm very excited. Overarching, like, why I do this series, I sp how many of you were around for the Conservation Cast? My podcast, my very, <laughs> my 60 episode long, very successful conservation podcast, very cool. Um, the point of the series is to do this podcast, but uh, better and stronger, and to really go to the places where they're doing the work, um, to see it up close, because I think that's so important. There are so many people doing so many different things for conservation, and I just want to highlight those organizations, because they're so important. Um, and this is one of my favorite podcasts that I did. Regan was the one on my podcast, that she was the guest on the episode. Um, lots of me's, hello. Uh, so where do I donate? You can do command donate or uh, just in my donate link. Their PayPal is attached to my stream today. So any donations that you make to me through PayPal will go straight to to uh, Wolf Conservation Center. Wasn't around but been listening to them back. Oh, thank you. That's so cool. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, that's the reason that I have this series is is to highlight these organizations and the cool work that they're doing. I was going to say something else, and I forgot what it is. Mon, ma, morana, Moranosaurus. <laughs> thank you for the fifty dollars. Mobacity. Thank you for the sixty-nine dollars. Conch with the seventeen fifty-four. Axial Mars with fifty dollars. Thank you so much. This is kind of a scary. We've raised, kind of a scary. Oh no, I'm blind. Never mind. Oh, thank you, Mick. Saved. <laughs> Mick with the twenty-five dollars. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Camera is good. Yeah, how's everything look? We're on, um, we have a hotspot, but we're not using it. This is just New York. It's cold in New York, by the way. Um, actually, it's about the same as Texas, probably, right now. Texas is really cold. Hi, Connor. Dylan with $100 and B-Love with $50. Thank you so much. So again, just as a reminder, if you guys are filtering in, this organization, they have 32 wolves on the facility that I am standing on right now. And then they have wolves that are part of a species survival plan. So they do, um, they do breeding and uh, recovery and release for Mexican gray wolves and red wolves, which is super, super vital to those wild populations. Again, Mexican red wolves, there are eight left in the wild, eight individuals known left in the wild, um, and Mexican gray wolves, about 130 from what I last read. Note, this is all from reading that I've done recently. Regan and Spencer and Sean, all the people that we're gonna meet on this stream or that you're gonna meet on this stream, they know way more than I do. I don't know anything about wolves, um, but I'm, I'm here to bridge that gap and to highlight them on my channel. So, thank you so much. Eight, are they tracked? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. They are, they're able to track, track those movements. Um, holy cow. Jato with a hundred dollars. Thank you for the hundred dollars. We are almost at a thousand dollars already. Um, all your donations today, again, are going straight to a nonprofit uh, that is taking care of these wolves and helping to save their wild populations. One of the three largest facilities in North America that's doing that um, for these two species. So, big time. I've been on a roll with repeating myself lately. More people, people have been filtering in really fast, so I just feel like I have to. Oh, 
Satan, thank you for reminding me. If you guys have questions, I will probably answer them through the stream because I'll be reading chat, but you can also do hashtag ask uh, and it'll go into a um, sheet that I can read off of and I can ask the staff here. Um, I might be able to try to answer some of those questions as well. All set? All right, that was quick. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, feel free to ask that way. Guys, this is Regan. Hey, Regan is the director of education. There are about 7,500 students. Wow, so far, amazing. <laughs> um, could you explain to them? Really sure. Well? So we are doing a health check today for four Mexican gray wolves. Mexican gray wolves are very endangered. There's only 196 left in the wild in the U.S., about 40 to 45 in northern Mexico. And today we're conducting a health check for a family of four. It's mom, Rosa, and her three daughters, Bria, Helen, and Diane. And so we are doing just a general wellness check. So we have one of our veterinarians here and she will be conducting a quick exam to make sure all of the girls are healthy and giving out a series of vaccinations as well. And so we have the wolves in capture boxes up here. So they're wooden boxes and they allow us to kind of gently hold the wolves down so we can conduct those procedures. The wolves are awake and alert the entire time. That's best for their health. It also helps reinforce that humans are a little dangerous and humans are not something we want to spend a lot of time here in the wild. So it helps keep them very fearful of us. And so we're going to be entering right in here. We are joined with one of our volunteer vets today, Dr. Renee Beha, and she'll be conducting a check along with our curator, Rebecca. Peel here, thank you for the $500 donation. And you like my head and Jen, thank you so much. That's the implants they're gonna get. Uh, I will go, I will, yeah, leave them where they are for now. So Rebecca, we're here with over 7,500 Hello. <laughs> uh, all learning about Mexican gray wolves. So we're about to get some blood, both for, for her health check as well as for blood banking. Vacutainer butterfly, for those of you that are, might be a vet tech, these are fantastic for pulling blood in, in the field. Because you can pull as much as you need, and it gives you a little flexibility with that line. So like I said, we're going to do vaccines, she's going to get her physical, we'll try and get a fecal if we can, heart temperature, heart rate, respiration, um, and then before we bring her out of the box, we're going to um, give her three implants, which is birth control, um, because these ladies are mature and they get a little aggressive during breeding season with one another. So in order to help manage that aggression, uh, birth control helps kind of just bring things down a notch. Um, they've had it last year and it really made a difference in the pack, pack dynamics. So we're gonna get it again. It's, it lasts six months uh, and it's just a, an implant under the skin. No, we have an IDEX account, so I send it directly. Yeah, it's nice when they give us a nice discount. And then some of this I, I will freeze for banking. So. And I know in the veterinary world, sometimes you'll try to pull from like a back leg to save the front legs for IVs. Mm -hmm. But in this case, um, we get whatever leg is closest. That's fair. <laughs> because it's not worth stressing them out and moving them. Imagine and and, and they don't really get IVs <laughs> because... <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth getting a jug. Yeah. No, a right? jug I have never, ever gotten on a wolf. Um, that would be really hard, unless they were sedated. Yeah. yeah. 
Are you that tech? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Blood. Now I'm going to get out of Renee's way and let her do her thing. Oh, I'll take the outbound scope. So you'll need scissors to cut it open. Um, I had opened one before just to check it. And then just hand it to me when you use this. So this family is home, uh, as we said earlier, to four wolves, and one of them, Rosa, is actually one of our oldest wolves here. She was born here in 2008, and she is turning 15, <laughs> I do math correctly, she's turning 15 in the spring, um, and she has a really extensive family unit as well. Um, so she's here with her three daughters right now, but she actually also has six sons that currently live at the Stone Zoo in Boston, and they were all born here in 2018. And they're not Rosa's first children. She actually gave birth to one daughter in 2016, actually right in this very enclosure. Um, and we nicknamed that daughter Trumpet because she made a lot of really loud squeaky noises when she was born. And Trumpet still lives here, um, and she's now a mother of her own. She has... Um, She's had three separate litters or groups of pups over the years, and two of her daughters actually now live in the wild. They were cross-fostered when they were just a few days old to wild wolf families as a way to um, both increase the wild population of wolves, but also improve genetic diversity. Wild Mexican gray wolves in the U.S. are roughly as related to one another as full siblings. And so releasing from captivity from centers like ours or centers across the country is a great way to get wolves out there that aren't so closely related to those wild wolves. And and so the first cross foster uh, was conducted in 2019, and it was with a puppy we named Hope uh, for what she symbolized for Mexican wolf recovery. And she was brought to the Saffle Pack in Arizona. And then just this past spring, um, one of our pups nicknamed Crumbo was brought to the Iron Creek Pack in New Mexico. And it's very exciting because while we love giving these wolves a great life here, we ultimately understand that the best life for a wolf is the wild. Um, and so for wolves that have that opportunity immediately, it's very exciting. And right now in the U.S., cross fosters are the only way pups can be released into the wild. And it's really the only way wolves in the U.S. can be released at all. Um, so we are pushing for additional adult releases, family group releases, because they're just as successful. Um, but it also is really unfortunate that if you don't happen to be one of the few lucky pups chosen to be cross-fostered that you just can't be released. Um, and Mexico is conducting adult releases, so there's always the opportunity for wolves to be released into Mexico, but we'd like to see the um, uh, additional adult releases in the U.S. as well. 
um, to give these wolves the best life possible. So mm -hmm. while Rosa at this point is just too old to be released, the average lifespan of a wild wolf is four to six years on average, maybe up to 10 if they're living in an area where they're protected. Um, and Rosa at soon to be 15 is just simply too old to be released, but her daughters could still be wonderful release candidates. So our goal here is to keep them as wild and as healthy as possible, which is why we're doing these health checks, uh, making sure that they're really the healthiest they can be. Um, and then also ultimately keeping them wild because I don't think after this experience that they're going to be too keen on people um, right. when they're being you know examined quite closely with a group of people around. So it really does keep them healthy, but it also helps maintain that wild behavior, which is great. Um, and it looks like they're wrapping up this check over here, so we can certainly uh, make our way back over uh, to see how, <laughs> how this is going. Really like get a wait on her. I mean, we're not yeah. getting our hands on her for another year. So. No, I know get a weight on her, yeah. but I mean for pro heart. Yes. While she's in here, do it. For it's her. better to do it for the for the weight because then it won't be effective, and I need her having. <laughs> <being positive. laughs> oh, it's it's not fun. No. No, aren't. He he's positive for many years though. Oh really? Yeah. If you hear it beep, let me know because I can't. This one's this one's. Slow. Was it a red wolf? <laughs> oh, yeah. One up to nine. Can I get a wipe? For four implants, Renee? They're like uh, microchips? Yeah. Four of them? Yeah. Hey, where do they go? Right in between the shoulder blades. Okay. So in each needle is a little, like a grain of rice, basically. Mm -hmm. And that serves as a, um, it's called desilorelin or superlin. And it serves as a birth control. I have to show you Okay. Mm -hmm. I can use one. When we do artificial insemination, because we have to remove it, because it also it induces ovulation, and then it and then it goes into active with the birth control. So um, these steps, yeah. But to do an AI, we need to get rid of it, or else it's going to come out. So we have been working on artificial insemination here with my team. We work with Dr. Chong at Cornell. Um, and what we, to do that, we have to induce ovulation, so we can time the insemination at the right time, which is really hard. <laughs> um, but we use these to... Uh, last one, four, right? Yeah. To induce ovulation. Mm -hmm. um, but then at a certain time, actually, um, 
Dabbledore, thank you for the $50. Anonymous with $3. Power T with $20. Fana with $10. Krosek with $75. Slice of, life, Slice of Life with $50. Chubby with $10. And I can't scroll, but there's more. Um, so we're almost at $2,000 raised. This is for Wolf Conservation Center. Um, for those of you who are just joining, we're going to re-explain what's going on in a second. Um, but this is a nonprofit organization that supports the protection of wolves in North America. Uh, here, they can get out of their way. So we're doing health checks today, and I will have Regan re-explain how they do these health checks and the reason that they do them. Um, but before that, if you're just, Mia, thank you for the $200. That gets us over our 2K mark. Thank you so much. Um, they're going to weigh this wolf, and then we're going to watch another health check. But before we do that, I'm going to play a video. Um, that describes the center a little bit better, so you can see a little more about what they're about. Um, and if you would like to donate um, during the stream, that would be great. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's really early. So we're gonna play this, the, min the four minute video, and then be back in just a second. Strong and wild, wolves once inhabited most of the United States. More than a symbol of wilderness, scientists agree that wolves play a critical role in maintaining healthy ecosystems. By regulating prey population, wolves prevent the overconsumption of vital plant habitats. Their presence indirectly enables plants and trees to flourish, which impacts the survival of songbirds, beavers, pronghorns, and even fish. This ripple effect throughout plant and animal communities can even alter the landscape itself. For this reason, wolves are known as a keystone species. Their presence is vital to the health, structure, and resilience of native ecosystems. But centuries of hunting and trapping have sought to eliminate wolves from the American landscape. And by the mid-1900s, the unremitting slaughter by humans had brought wolves to the brink of extinction. Today, with support from the American public, efforts have begun to right this horrible wrong, to reintroduce and restore these essential creatures to their rightful places in our landscapes, our hearts, and our culture. In 1987, red wolves were restored to their ancestral home in the southeastern United States. In 1995, gray wolves were restored in Yellowstone National Park and northern Idaho. And in 1998, critically endangered Mexican gray wolves were returned to their native range in the southwest. The Wolf Conservation Center has been part of this effort since 1999. Today, our work is more important than ever. Science has concluded that we have entered an unprecedented period of climate change and human-caused sixth mass extinction. In response to this crisis, the WCC is preparing the next generation to meet environmental challenges using our three-pronged mission of education, recovery, and advocacy. Through our online and offline educational programs, we've taught hundreds of thousands about the true nature of wolves and their importance in ecosystems. We host 15,000 visitors per year and reach millions more through our online presence and advocacy. As a participant in the Federal Species Survival Plan for the Mexican Gray Wolf and the Red Wolf, we are giving critically endangered wolves a second chance. We help prevent their extinction through research, captive breeding, and recommendations for reintroduction. But our work is far from over. Many challenges remain. Although we've seen an increase in the United States wolf population, we've also witnessed an alarming decrease in their protection. The very policies that afford endangered species protection are under political attack like never before. Wolves continue to be subjected to aggressive hunting and trapping in states where their federal protections have been lifted. Wild Mexican gray wolves face serious recovery challenges that will affect their future success. With less than 30 individuals remaining in the wild, red wolves are being poached closer to extinction every day. The Wolf Conservation Center is working to change that through litigation, testimony in federal hearings, and equipping the public with the knowledge and tools to become better advocates. We won't give up. We believe that no species should have to face extinction at the hands of humanity, much less twice. Every voice raised in support of wildlife and wild places can make a difference. When we all work together, we can affect real change. We see 
see a world where robust populations of wolves roam wild landscapes across the continent, where no species of wolf cowers on the edge of extinction, and where every child learns of and respects these essential creatures. Now, we need your help. In order to face the challenges of the coming decades, we must rear and release more wolves, educate more people on their importance in restoring and rebalancing ecosystems, and fight for those policies and protections that will ensure vibrant populations of this keystone species. Join us in making this vision a reality. Can you hear me? Can yeah. you see me? I'm pretty sure that's Are we back? <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Thank you guys for watching that video. I'm glad you liked it. It looked like you liked it. Uh, Laura, thank you for the $20 anonymous. Thank you for the $5 donation. Um, we're at the Wolf Conservation Center in New York today, and we're here with Regan, the Director of Education. Uh, she's going to explain what's going on right now, and then we're going to go check out the action again. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. Like Maya said, we're here at the Wolf Conservation Center in New York and we are conducting a health check for four of our Mexican gray wolves. Mexican gray wolves are an endangered species of gray wolf and there are about 196 living in the wild in the US, only 40 to 45 living in northern Mexico and that's it for wild wolves in terms of Mexican gray wolves. So these four here are undergoing just a quick health and wellness check. We do these every year. It's a way to make sure the wolves are healthy, uh, they are given vaccines, we weigh them, we draw blood, and then they're released back into their enclosure. These checks ensure they stay healthy. They also ensure that they maintain a good fear of humans because in order for these wolves to be released into the wild, which is the ultimate goal, they have to be afraid of us. And so doing these health checks when they're awake and alert really helps to kind of further that goal. Um, but for these three wolves, it's mom and three daughters. So mom is Rosa. She's turning 15 in the spring. And then she has her three daughters, Diane, Bria, and Helen. Diane just received her clean bill of health weighing in at about 40 pounds. And her two sisters are about to have their health checks as well. So we're we're here with our team of staff, volunteers, wolf experts that are really good at handling these wolves, making sure that they're calm throughout the entire procedure. And right now these wolves are in boxes. So each wolf has their own, what we call um, like a capture box. And it's a way for us to keep them contained, gently hold them down. So you'll see a variety of tools that are being used. Just understand that these tools are designed to keep the wolves feeling safe and feeling comfortable, um, but also to allow us to take the necessary information we need in terms of their health and well-being. So we can uh, head right over here um, to the next daughter um, who's having her health check. Axial, thank you for the 50, Tara, thank you for the $100. No, I forgot this. Yeah. It's okay, so we can go. We can go right up. Thank you. Let me scan her from here. Take care. Oh six nine. <laughs> Do you use these? Oh, okay. Yeah. The last crew from Bergen County so that you would appreciate this. Yes. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> Are like that. I thought it was maybe a batch I had. Yeah. 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 Yeah
probably on purpose. No, but she's no, no, she's more tired though. Yeah, yeah she doesn't true. go straight to the dog. She's yeah, the one that was spicy. She's usually like the same as her short term. She's kind of maturing, probably. Yeah, she saved it for the box. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's normally exhausted by the time she gets to the box. Yeah, but what's this wolf's name? Helen, after our founder. If you want to get respirations. Oh. Oh, you're in charge. I will get respirations when I can see her. <laughs> so I'll be out of your way in a second. Last two. Do you guys bank the blood here? Keep it here? No. Um, we do have a freezer that freezes to a certain temperature uh, so we can hold it, but this will be sent to the uh, St. Louis Zoo. Oh, oh, no. Yeah, Mexican Wolf. St. Louis Zoo. They, they keep the blood. Okay. Okay. Where does they keep Red Wolf? Yeah. blood. Uh, Red Wolf goes to Arkansas State. Okay. They're the repository for it. I'll get it when I come out. Yeah, banking blood's important for research, for DNA, genetics. It's just, it's good to, you can't have enough of it. Get out of everyone's way. Respirations 140.
um, the mom bird. It's beeping. Now it's beeping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's from the last one. Yeah. little thermometers. <laughs> <laughs> we try. <laughs> <laughs> So a little lower temperature, a little lower heart rate. Not as nervous. They're actually they're very respectful of her, but it will help their behavior transfer. You've got that sweet new den now, so right? plenty of room for everyone to spread out. Yeah, actually, there's all this space now. We'll have a nice system. <laughs> Don't pretty <laughs>
a bunch of donations um, to where I need to open a browser source to read them. Um, Bibble with $219.33, Slice of Life with $10, Satan with... Okay, thank you Satan. Uh, Bibble with $142, Hammy with $5, Shrez with 100 Um, Bibble with 200 Rat with 7 Maya with 50 Mick with... Or Mick... Mick Lamb Homeboy with 25 Slut, slutty with 10, Bibble with another 200, Kristoff with 10, Wyatt with $100, and then Tara with that $100 from before, that is a $3,500. What the heck? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, they're, oh, they're weighing this one. No. <laughs> oh. She's named after our founder, Helen Grimo, who's a classical pianist. All of the pups in this litter, uh, all nine of them, were named after female conservationists. So oh, she's cool. being released back into the enclosure. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be 27. One door they can hold the pin the hole down, the other door I can get into it. Inject. Thank you. I just need longer arms. <laughs> go, go, gadget. Uh. Left shoulder, pro heart. Yeah, they read her back In between shoulder blades for ivermectin. Axial, thank you for the hundred dollars, and Xana with fifty-one dollars. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more um, that we're gonna, right, that we're gonna watch in three. here, and then we're gonna walk around the facility. I think. I don't want to be in the way. I feel like we're in the way. <laughs> Yeah, and so this last one is Bria. Um, and so all of our wolves here have names, like human names, um, because it's a great way to identify them as individuals, connect people to them. Um, and so we always use those names when referring to them because they're not just like another number. Um, so, um, and we can always shift back this way too if we want before um, everything's settled. But um, so Bria um, is the third girl in here, named after. Um, a now teenager who actually was using her artwork to raise money for endangered species. Um, so we named Bria in honor of her. Um, and with um, all three of these girls, you would have noticed that they were receiving birth control um, during these health check procedures because they're going to be living together throughout breeding season, which for wolves is late winter. Um, we uh, just want to control those hormone levels a bit. They can get a little, a uh, little excited with each other, a little aggressive. Um, and in the wild, this wouldn't be a problem because they would be dispersing. They are of an age where they could have their own family. They could breed if they wanted to, if they had a male to breed with. But um, with Mexican gray wolves living in captivity, and it's the same for red wolves in captivity, breeding pairs are determined based on genetics and based on overall space. And so with a population that is pretty large in captivity with not enough um, room for new breeding pairs, um, 
wolves that have um, a lot of siblings or they're very well represented in the captive population often don't get the chance to breed, um, at least not immediately. So birth control is a way to keep the family together, keep them as a functioning family unit, but not have them get too angry with each other. So um, it's a nice way to maintain those family ties because wolves are very social. They live in family groups and we want to maintain as much of a wild um, kind of semblance of a family as we can and birth control helps us do that. Um, birth control can also be given to wolves to better control when they're ovulating so we could do artificial inseminations as well. That's not the case with these three but we have done it in the past um, and we simply remove that birth control implant um, before the insemination takes place so they can actually become pregnant. With these three the birth control will just stay in. We won't be removing it during breeding season. Um, but it looks like Bria um, is all set to go over here. Um, so she's uh, being um, starting to be processed with uh, Dr. Renee Beha, one of our wonderful volunteer veterinarians, um, and of course, uh, key members of our staff. Um, and we have other facilities joining us as well. We serve as a training facility uh, yeah, for new members, cool. for new zoos that are joining, so they can better understand how to um, carefully handle these animals and treat them with the utmost respect. And so we're very honored to do that, and it's a great way to make sure that every new uh, facility is really um, speaking about wolves the best way possible, using those names, really highlighting wolves as individuals and not just wolves as another number um, that's important to grow a population because these wolves have thoughts and feelings just like we do. Um, it's really important to highlight that and give them that respect. So uh, we can shift okay. over um, as well. And Mitch and Axial, Axial, thank you for the 73 and 16, and Mitch with the 10, Bibble with 123, um, and Salty with 50, Tetris with 25, Bibble with a 66, that got us over our 4K mark, thank you so much. And just jumping in hearing that name Salty, uh, we did actually have a Red Wolf named Salty, Oh, uh, just as a fun fact. <laughs> and Snopper, thank you for the $77, okay, we'll go over and... <laughs> How many years have we been doing this together? Oh my god, 20 something, 20, yeah. well as long as I've been here, so 22? It's always an opportunity to learn. Absolutely. Okay. Cold? I don't know. <laughs> you know. Henry, you stopped by during COVID. I think you're gonna uh, oh, film more. That? You're not gonna get that. Oh, that didn't go. I do yeah. a little. I I redo it. I think I lost a section on that though. Oh. I have the other two. Okay. okay. Yeah, I always have more oh, than yeah. enough, but I'll, I'll fill longer on these two. Yeah. Um, he's living in New York City. This is Henry, the oh, founder. Yeah. yeah. Um, as far as I know. Remarried or something? I don't know. Is. I haven't heard talk to him. A little pump. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Is it healthy? Yeah. So you get a good result. <laughs> Gotta get your pumps in. <laughs> We're working out. Yeah. Right. Dude, walking up that hill and you must have you right up though. It was 2001 that we joined the Mexican Wolf Program. Yeah, so it's 20. But you, you neutered ADCA. Yeah. So it's been 20. So it's... I started volunteering in 2000. So yeah, so it's 22 years. You, you and Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Who else? Oh, Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hasn't happened Thank yet. Thank you. But. 
<laughs> We're live. Today would be the day. <laughs> no, today would be the day. <laughs> Get respirations. <laughs> one respiration, girl. One on the side. Good, good. Respiration. 24. 120. Did you get that, Babs? 120. Heart rate. <laughs> Respiration. <laughs> 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 That was us with Diane. Yeah. <laughs> Not Diane, us. There we go. Is no, no. Do you do it if it's like indicated? Like if, it's one thing if we find something, yes. Okay. Um, all our health checks are done under manual restraint. Okay. Um, and then we only use sedation for obviously like semen collection or anything in really okay. invasive. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I have a equine vet that volunteers, and so she brings her machine on site, okay. which is really nice, because then we just do it up here. That's really cool. Yeah, and we're able to do it in a box lake, mm -hmm. which, yeah, it's I really nice. Except I was thinking the only thing that we would have to say our rules for the x-rays, but if I can figure out like, what way it is. Depending on the x-rays, you need a source um, to take basic stuff, especially when you have a group of girls in a pack, and mm -hmm. you have to say, it gets complicated with dynamics that makes sense because I don't want that to go back. So, mm -hmm. um, and and we have to do it before because I, I lock up everybody yeah. <laughs> and then I don't let them out until she comes back. So mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, any x-rays that we've had to do have been awake here. And it's minimal. It does mean. not work well in the cold though, trying to keep the whole computer and everything oh, yeah. warm. That's, that's but that's um, so we've checked, you know, done pregnancy ultrasounds. <laughs> Yeah. And then you'll just straight, you know, it reaffirms it. There we go. And in the field, you know, it doesn't seem like it. It's still just for months. And if that's the case, we could actually use one of those insulated grocery bags. Yeah. It fits in there. You could with some warmers. Yeah, that's true. And now they're fancy little laptops, you know, they're much smaller than they used to be. Oh. Um, they're getting smaller by the year. <laughs> Ultrasounds and stuff. Soon it'll be like. Here, it'll be like Star Trek. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's crazy. I was going to say just put a filter over your, your smartphone camera. Oh, yeah. and, and it's like, oh, it's right now. <laughs> so, uh, just uh, for the uh, Zoo people, on warmer days and a lot of um, activity capturing, some of the temps would go up to 105. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is 103.5. 
we do captures when the temperature always oh, it's cooler. Yeah. yeah. We try to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. When it's seventy in November, you can't do yeah. much about that. No, <laughs> but but if it happens to be a little warmer day and yeah. do anything, they they do. I don't know whether you can. Oh, we got one. Oh, you, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. All right. See what's going on in the, in the wet. Yeah. <laughs> hey, sharp, <please. laughs> hey, sharp, <please. laughs> See, thank you for the 50 LT Franco 25 bibble with 120. Mr. Tensi with 50 bibble with 87 slice of life with $25. It's at $4,452.79. Thank you so much um, for those donations. They're going to weigh this one, I think, yes. and then we will head out of here. Is, um, Essie's lagging, but it's probably fine. Chat, is Essie still lagging? Also, good job taking notes. You're being very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She's okay, so going to be weighing. What temp? 80. 80. 80. 80. 80 pounds? Oh, well, oh, which, minus 32. Yeah, minus 32. I was like, wow, she is big. <laughs> <laughs> so what did it come out? 48? 48? 48. 48. So 1.09. What was the temp when I handed it? I think it was 102. 103. 103. Something? Yeah, 103. We're going to have to... I do the um, point seven time.
between where it belongs, in between shoulder blades. Okay. Left leg ivermectin. Left rump, pro heart. How much pro heart, Rebecca? I got, uh, I'll oh, tell you. Yeah. I'm gonna get all of you. Corgi with 20, Brock with 50, Set Range with 69, Wolf with 50, Bibble with 47. Um, thank you guys so much for those donations. Okay. Um, I think we're gonna go for a little yeah. walk. I will follow your lead. Yeah, so we're gonna walk down towards uh, one of our Red Wolf enclosures. We have a total of 10 Red Wolves that live on site. Um, this is an enclosure right here. It's home to six Red Wolves, a dad and his children. Um, but we're gonna move down towards um, more of our on exhibit area. So most of the wolves that live here really don't see people on a daily basis, and that's to keep them as wild as possible and prepare them for release into the wild. But the way our center is structured, we do have some enclosures that are on exhibit. The wolves always have the opportunity to not be visible. They can go wherever they want, but uh, we're moving down now towards those wolves. Um, and so we can discuss a bit more about some of the red wolves we have here. We were just primarily Mexican gray wolf focused during those health checks. And our red wolves have health checks too. Um, they belong to a captive breeding program that is virtually identical to the Mexican gray wolf breeding program. Uh, these programs are known as SAFE, or Saving Animals from Extinction, and they are AZA run programs um, that are focused on uh, releases to the wild. Um, and so we serve as um, essentially care facilities. So we house these wolves, we give them food, uh, we actually collect roadkill deer from the surrounding streets and feed that to these wolves as a way to best prepare them for release into the wild. So they're eating those wild food sources. Um, but we also conduct those health checks and some of our wolves are chosen for breeding each year as well. Um, and so we um, really don't do much during breeding season. We just hope the wolves uh, kind of take to it naturally. Um, but we do conduct health checks if there are any pups born. And we also communicate um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in terms of releases. Um, and we communicate with other facilities as well. So. Uh, really not very hands-on when it comes to the wolves, but very hands-on when it comes to speaking up for their recovery and working with other groups as well. So with Mexican gray wolves, for example, uh, we joined up with several other groups a few years ago to file a lawsuit against the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, regarding, we're gonna go this way, um, so this swings out, um, regarding their recovery plan for Mexican gray wolves. We felt it wasn't addressing poaching, um, and it also wasn't addressing uh, genetic concerns, um, and we also want to expand the release area for Mexican gray wolves. So um, hoping to see some progress on that. We did have a minor victory. The um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does have to address poaching and human-caused um, mortality for Mexican gray wolves, which is great. Um, and hopefully that will lead to an improvement because Mexican gray wolves uh, are facing a lot of challenges still in the wild, even though their population has been growing. Um, it's really nowhere near what it should be for recovery. So we're hoping to see some changes there. Uh, this enclosure that we're walking by right now is home to two red wolves. Their names are Jacques and Sage. Jacques is a boy, Sage is a female, um, and they are a potential breeding pair. So we say potential breeding pair because these wolves have been considered to be a good genetic match, um, which means they have a low um, inbreeding coefficient. They're not closely related to each other. 
but it doesn't actually mean that they will get along. Luckily, they do seem to get along fairly well. Um, whether or not that will actually result in breeding remains to be seen. Breeding season will really start to kick in late January, early February, and a gestation period for a wolf is about 63 days. So uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll have pups in the spring. But this will take us down towards more of those on-exhibit wolves. Um, we'll leave some chat to know about red wolves. Can you say on-exhibit? So where we are currently is not where the public is? Correct, yes. So okay. we are behind the scenes uh, at the Wolf Conservation Center right now. This is an area the public does not see. So if you were to come here in person um, for one of our education programs, this area would be off limits. Um, but we do access this area for health checks, um, general maintenance, things like that. But once we go through this gate, that's taking us to our kind of public area. Um, so everyone watching is seeing things that they wouldn't see if they were here in person. Chat. VIPs. Um, Zale with $50, Sloth with 20, Anonymous with 200, and Dribble with 95. That brought us over our 5K mark. Thank you so much. Awesome. Oh, sorry, sorry, so tell. Uh, you'll actually see two of our red wolves are visible uh, in their enclosure. Oh, so they're resting on top of a den. And we can, they'll most likely stay. So you can kind of see them, I mean, we can in person. I don't know how this translates to video, but there's two red wolves back on that den. We can loop down towards their more public viewing area to see if we get a better shot. But that's a male and a female. Their names are Tyke and Lava. Tyke was actually born at our center in 2015. He's seven years old. And Lava was born out west in Washington State at the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. They were actually the very first facility to have captive red wolves. They pioneered the captive breeding program a few decades ago. Um, and so Lava was born there. And just as with Jacques and Sage and many of the other wolves here, they were chosen based on genetics. So she flew out here a few years ago. And we are hoping that this year they will um, have some pups. They have been slowly getting more comfortable with each other. So now, as we saw from the two of them resting together in the den, they seem to be fairly, fairly comfortable with each other, which is great. Um, but having these red wolves here is really just one component of the work we're doing to really help their recovery. We also advocate on their behalf, whether it's doing outreach um, to our constituents, outreach with other organizations, but we've also been expanding our research network as well. So we have um, a research division here at the Wolf Conservation Center, and so you'll see those two um, looking at us right now. Um, and so let me actually open up uh, one of these photo flaps if it might be helpful. Um, so recently, our center created a research division. We've worked with scientists very closely over these last few years because we strongly believe in science-based recovery and science-based conservation. So working with scientists is a must, especially when it comes to conveying that information to the general public. Um, but Dr. Joey Hinton, our senior research scientist, is actually one of the leading experts on red wolf ecology. And he is currently working with a team of geneticists studying uh, canids that live in the, in, if you want to put the camera through if that helps at all, studying um, canids in the Gulf Coast region of Texas and Louisiana and they actually um, have been found to have ancient red wolf DNA um, and that could be really beneficial for wolves moving forward. So um, Joey is uh, working along with uh, one of our other staff members, our research associate Sunny Murphy, um, to uh, get that information out to the public, but also better understand what information those canids could have for wild red wolves. Because the population of red wolves is so low, right now there are currently only 10 known to remain in the wild. They're found in North Carolina. We don't know much about where they can best survive, what impact they might have uh, on the environment. And so Joey's research is really groundbreaking because we're able to learn more from those red wolf coyote canids just what red wolves need to survive and thrive. So um, again, he's working with a team of geneticists studying those animals, and we have a lot of great resources on our website about how um, that work is really benefiting red wolf conservation, which is fascinating. Um, and with these two, Tyke and Lava, again, the goal for these two is release as well into North Carolina. That's the only active release site, so that's the only place they could currently be released. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is focusing on cross fosters for red wolf puppies, which is when captive-born wolf pups are placed with a wild family that has pups the same age. They adopt them and raise them as their own. Um, and cross fostering actually first began with red wolves in 2002. Um, and there um, 
have been a few recent cross fosters of red wolves, a few adult releases as well. So if these two have pups and there's a wild litter of pups born roughly the same time, um, who knows what could happen in terms of uh, possible cross fosters. Um, but it's very exciting um, that we're seeing kind of resumed efforts to recover red wolves okay. after a period of uh, not so many releases. It's nice to see releases moving forward. And can you go over again uh, red wolf populations in the wild, how many there are and what their biggest threats are? Sure. So the current population of known red wolves, meaning red wolves that have active tracking collars, so scientists for sure know they're out there, is 10. Um, this is a very low number. It's not the lowest it's ever been. Um, it was actually eight in 2020. Um, and their biggest threats are human-caused mortality, whether that's poaching. Um, a red wolf that was released into the wild uh, was actually found shot in a field uh, last spring, and um, it had suffocated um, from mud that just filled its lungs. So shot in the spine and left. Um, hunting red wolves um, is illegal because they're an endangered species, um, but they're also facing challenges from vehicle mortality, so getting hit by cars. Um, we released a, a red wolf into the wild back in 2021. His name was Devin. He was actually born right in this enclosure. And he was released in uh, June of 2021 into North Carolina. We were so excited for him because these wolves grow up living behind a fence. And while it's great because they're with their families, it's not the best life for them. And think about the fact that they can see birds flying by, they see coyotes, they know there's something out there beyond a fence, they just never get to see it. And so he was chosen for release and he was released with a female um, in the hopes that they would stay together and have pups. Um, and we just were so excited for him, thinking about how excited he must have been. But a few days after he was released, he was struck and killed by a car. Um, and so it's a challenge for all red wolves, regardless of if they're released from captivity or born in the wild, just because these areas have become much more populated. Um, and there wasn't a lot of awareness about red wolves being released. And so drivers don't have any idea that they should be a bit more mindful on the roads. Uh, but those areas in North Carolina are very populated because it leads to the Outer Banks. So a very popular vacation destination. Um, and there's not a lot of visibility. You know, a red wolf leaves the woods, they're right on the road. Right. Um, and so it's really hard for them to see, but also for drivers to see as well. But a lot of local organizations and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have been working together to make the roads a bit safer. So they have... Um, started using those electronic message boards, giving visitors an alert that, you know, red wolf crossing next five mm -hmm. miles. And because these wolves have active tracking collars, they can shift the message boards based on where the wolves move. Cool. Yeah. And they've also begun um, putting reflective tape on those tracking collars. So if uh, someone's driving at night and a red wolf crosses the road, that uh, those headlights bounce off the collar and hopefully you'll see the wolf and avoid that. But there's still been, um, death. So there um, were six puppies born in the wild uh, in April for the first time since 2018, which mm -hmm. is very exciting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one of the female pups was hit by a car um, about a month ago. Um, she did not have a collar yet. Wolves aren't given collars until they're roughly one year old because that's when they're kind of full, fully grown. So um, tragically, she passed away. But that really is the biggest threat, um, humans, whether it's through poaching or vehicles. Um, so hopefully increased releases, but also perhaps better release sites, mm -hmm. uh, better habitat um, could really be beneficial to help this population really establish a stronghold in the wild. Right. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Very good. Um, and we do also have um, some gray wolves as well. Yeah. Um, if you guys want to see kind of our rock stars, uh, they're the public faces of the center. Um, and actually, um, right behind us, we have Sean and one of our externs, Beatriz. Beatriz is a master's student at Pace. Um, Hello. Sean is uh, one of our uh, educators, but also our volunteer coordinator as well. And Sean, if you want to start leading the group down, I'll just lock this up. But Sean can introduce us to that. Yeah. Cool. So you guys are the star of the show. The stars <laughs> of the show. Stars of the show. Yeah. <laughs> They're probably already watching us as we come down. And, oh, they were before. There they are. <laughs> oh, cute. Yes. Once we walk by. Yeah. Well, even when we can't see them, they can probably see us. So. <laughs> their curiosity, you know, regardless of their captive status as ambassadors or as part of our wild population, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're still doing wolf things. They're still using their wolf brains, and so they're still keeping an eye on what we're doing. And, Nakai and Alewa just tend to be a little more curious about what we do <laughs> than the wild wolves. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is part of what they do on a day in, day out. So, out in the back, 
you have Nick Kai, we call him our resident shy guy. Oh. We'll kind of keep his distance until he starts to feel a little more comfortable. Um, I can open up a couple of these camera flaps for you guys. Great, thank you so yeah. much. Um, so Nick Kai, uh, despite his, you know, captive status and him spending the rest of his life with us uh, at the Wolf Conservation Center, still shows his very wild, wolfy, uh, natural fear of people. Um, so he's, he might keep his distance for a little bit. Um, but Alewa is coming up front and center. She certainly likes to say hello. She's a little more outgoing than, than her little brother, Nakai. But these guys are both Rocky Mountain gray wolves. Um, so kind of like when you, um, when you think of a wolf, right? This is typically the wolves that you're thinking of. Rocky Mountain Greys, kind of the, <laughs> the the standard wolf, if you will. Um, but they belong to a subpopulation that spans uh, the Rocky Mountains in Canada, in addition to our Rocky Mountain states, so Colorado, um, Wyoming, and Montana, which is which are also states where uh, that have bits and pieces of uh, Yellowstone National Park in them. Uh, Idaho as well also has. Uh, Yellowstone National Park. So these kind of like Yellowstone wolves, if you will, are what most wolves think of when they see a wolf. Um, Nakai and Alewa have a bit of a, a different life here at the Wolf Conservation Center than our uh, Saving Animals from Extinction wolves. These guys, uh, they are our ambassadors, which basically just means that they will be, uh, you know, spending their lives in captivity with us, but also just kind of being a voice for wolves. Um, they, you know, their goal, their mission, you know, as wolf teachers is to spread the word about wolves and kind of buck a lot of these negative stereotypes, a lot of these bad ideas that people have of wolves. Um, yeah, and that's why we, you know, have this program. We, we, we run education programs uh, Fridays or excuse me, Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, typically twice a day uh, we have upwards of 40 people per groups and we also work with student groups during the week as yeah. well from Tuesday through Friday so these guys are constantly uh, you know constantly teaching working yeah. very hard as wolf teachers so, so how'd you come yeah. across these two where'd you get them originally so, yeah so they were uh, born at a breeding at a private breeding facility in Nevada and so that was the, you know bred specifically for this purpose Got to it. be ambassadors cool. um yeah so they were brought here when they were puppies originally uh brought as alewa and zephyr zephyr was alewa's litter mate um so they were born together and brought here to be ambassadors um alewa is 11 years old nikai is her younger brother mm -hmm. so born to the same parents to the same you know at the same breeding facility just you know a few years later so when the kai was brought here he was actually kept separate for a while from the kai or from alewa and zephyr because um you know they didn't recognize him immediately as little brother you know they weren't litter mates right. so there wasn't that connection of, of, of siblings so um yeah it took them a little bit of an adjustment period but then the kai was fully introduced into the pack a few years later so yeah very cool yeah um, guys, if you have questions, you can go ahead and start using that ask bot if you would like. Uh, you can do hashtag ask followed by your question. I'm going to pull some of them up. Okay. Actually, one of them was mm -hmm. how big can these specific wolves get? That's from Gandhi. Gotcha. So Nakai and Alewa are both roughly about 80 pounds. Um, gray wolves can weigh anywhere from 80 to 120. Um, if you do see some, some subpopulations of gray wolves, uh, can get a little bit larger than that. Some Arctic, uh, wolves can reach upwards to 140 pounds. Um, our Mexican gray wolves, which are a subspecies of these gray wolves, um, typically hover at, a, a, you know, a little smaller, so they can weigh, you know, typically anywhere from 45 to about 70 pounds. Um, and then our red wolves, uh, which are a completely different species of wolf altogether, uh, kind of fluctuate with that, you know, range that Mexican gray wolves have as well. So anywhere from 45 to, to 70 pounds. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, and then somebody asked, <laughs> seriously asked, are wolves, is their fur soft or no? <laughs> <laughs> is their fur soft? Um, it's kind of got that like downy, you know, it, it, they're really what you're looking at when you think of like the fluffiness of a wolf is yeah. their down coat. Uh, that can be pretty soft. Uh, yeah, for sure. Their guard hairs are going to be a little more coarse. So their outer coat is 
uh, waterproof and it has like oils on it. So that's a little more rough. Their undercoat though, what they will be shedding, uh, you know, in the spring and summer and then what they're gaining in the winter. So when you see them kind of like peak full fluff, yeah, that's pretty soft. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, and then, where did, uh, Meyer said, how many wolves have you released from this facility? Uh, so we have released several. We've released three adult Mexican gray wolves and we released technically two adult red wolves and then two puppies. Um, so that brings us to seven. Oh. Yes, seven. Um, and the pups are our most recent releases. They are both two Mexican gray wolves cross fostered in 2019 and 2022 respectively. Um, one to Arizona, one to New Mexico. And we did have Devin that we released um, into North Carolina in 2021. Um, but we also released a red wolf named Tom, kind of to the wild. He's living on an island off the coast of Florida. <laughs> um, so it's a wild life. I read about that it, island. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's Same super yeah. interesting. So the goal is that if he has any kids, that they could be really great release candidates to the mm -hmm. wild. So he's living living a nice life in Florida. <laughs> cool. Which is great. Um, and then Mick asked, how important are wolves for the ecosystem? That's a great question. Great question. Uh, <laughs> they are ecosystem engineers. As apex predators, um, you know, they help keep ecosystems in check. They will uh, hunt on basically what are sick or dying or old animals. Um, so they are helping get rid of disease in some of the populations of the animals that they're hunting. So, um, so not only are they helping keep uh, those grazers, those ungulates from, from, you know, their populations from getting too large, but uh, what they're also doing is keeping that population of animals healthy as well. Um, so as ecosystem engineers, uh, you know, when you're not seeing wolves in an area, you can get things like ecosystem collapse. Um, they kind of facilitate a, a full and healthy ecosystem uh, due to their harvesting, if you will, or their hunting uh, of these uh, of these prey animals like deer, bison, uh, you know, wild ungulates. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, uh, Nid with $20, Nightlife with $50, No Gator with 20 Experimental with 21, Radioactive Chinchilla, cool name, with $117, <laughs> and Zale with $77. That was it, that segue question is great. Um, we're gonna play another quick video. This video is not curated by Wolf Conservation Center, but uh, it's pretty neat. Um, and it'll add a little more on to Mick's question of how important are wolves to the ecosystem. So we're gonna play that video. Um, can we put a cam in the corner? So we'll, we'll keep showing him while that video is playing, but check that out. Watch that. Um, and then after we play this, mm -hmm. I think uh, if we can just answer like a few more of their questions. Sure. Yep. Uh, and then One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, that the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, 
they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes. And as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. But here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. That ask bot right now, it's your last chance to do that. Is it swapped? Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello. Uh. Video. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay, great. Um, sorry. Yeah, so uh, do hashtag ask followed by your question if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, now's your last chance to do that. Before we answer the questions, Regan is going to start a howl. <laughs> so um, Regan is over there because she said it's really loud and she doesn't want to scare you. So she's going to start a howl from over there. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Regan. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we have some questions from everybody. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, Tip said, how do they handle teaching them to hunt their own food before releasing them? That's a great question. So they, 
we'll provide food for them, uh, roughly what they'll be eating, uh, you know, equivalent to what they'll be eating in the wild. So typically they'll get about 15 to 20% of their body weight uh, in either deer or beaver or salmon or trout, basically food that gets donated to us from the Department of Environmental Conservation, the Department of Transportation, uh, as well as local hunters. Uh, but they are also free to hunt whatever falls into their enclosure, whatever happens to make their way into their enclosure. I call it a bad career move. If you're a chipmunk or a, a turkey or a yeah. small animal that decides, hey, this seems like a comfortable place place to hang out. Um, that certainly doesn't stop the wild wolves uh, from hunting or even the ambassadors, um, but we don't think it's fair to sort of put an animal that's going to be eaten uh, in an enclosure that it can't get out of, uh, but that doesn't seem to impact their, their hunting abilities. Uh, but when they do get released into the wild, it isn't just this hard and fast, you know, release into the wild. This is good luck, you know, see you never. Uh, it's actually a, a pretty specific process where they'll put up temporary fencing. Uh, they'll basically make an enclosure out in the wild that will have all of these, you know, critters that they'll naturally be hunting mm -hmm. that are available to them. So it isn't just this hard release. It allows them to acclimate to their new surroundings. So they're still able to work that instinct, work that, uh, you know, that natural hunting ability. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Um, Rhino friend said, why do wolves howl and how often do they do it? Awesome question. Uh, wolves will howl. That's their primary form of communication. Uh, there's a lot of ideas out there that they only howl at night or that they only howl, howl at the moon. moon. Yeah, right. Um, that's not true. That is their primary form of distant communication. Um, so they will howl to say hi to members in their pack. They will howl at other packs, at maybe rival packs, to let them know, hey, this is my territory, stay away. Um, also, they'll howl just to sing. Uh, a lot of people find that funny, uh, but no, they just, they like singing sometimes, so they'll just howl to do that as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, Zach Panthera said, what is the kind of enrichment that's done for the wolves here to keep them active? Yeah, so aside from them kind of just working their natural wolf brains by kind of chasing after whatever falls in there, uh, we will give them things like essential oils to, to work their sense of smell. Um, they have gotten uh, like dog toys in the past with like the stuffing and squeakers removed, obviously. Right. Uh, we've thrown those in there as well. Uh, for for holiday programs especially, we'll tend to like wrap up little gifts for them. We'll make, we'll put like a little wow. snack in there with essential oils, with spices and sort of things to work their brains a little bit. Um, yeah, aside from that,
tomorrow night. Yeah, Sam. Sandra. Yeah. All right. Sandra and Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're both in. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to Back. Alright. Sorry, guys. Um, our live view died, but now it's back. Um, we're getting close to the end of the stream anyway. I'm gonna, uh, we're going to answer a few more questions, and then I'm going to run some polls, and that'll be it for the day. Um, so, one of these questions, it's Liv Grace, asked, what is their favorite food? So the ambassadors really like bacon and hot dogs. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, uh, they also really like peanut butter. Um, they like bananas. Uh, those are amongst their favorites uh, for sure. Bacon and hot dogs seem to be the <laughs> the most favorite. Though. Nice. Okay. Um, and then Timber said, "How long do they live?" So. In captivity, it's a bit different since they do have a secure food source since they're not competing with other wolves. Uh, captivity, their lives can typically range up upwards of 15, 16 years old. In the wild, uh, you know, eight years old, like for Nakai, for an example, is, you know, a bit oh, old. Yeah. Uh, so typically in the wild, you're seeing four to six years. Um, so yeah, just quite drastic in terms of uh, captive lifespan versus wild lifespan. Got it. Yeah. All right. Um, and then last question, I think people have asked um, variations of this, but what can the average person or the average viewer do um, to advocate for wolves? It's an awesome question. So there are a lot of ways to help wolves. Many of you are already doing them just by donating, which is amazing. All of those donations go right to helping our center's mission, which overall is to educate and inspire and really support wolves in the wild through these release programs, through advocacy efforts. So even if you're not taking it any further beyond viewing this today, you're already helping. Um, but we really recommend teaching friends and family. One of the biggest threats wolves face is just lack of information or misinformation. And so making sure people understand wolves aren't dangerous, that they do play important roles in the environment, but also understanding that they are facing challenges and they do need support. Um, so right now there are areas in the U.S. where wolves are still hunted. Wolves are hunted in Montana. You'll hear we have a group of uh, students making their way up in just a few minutes. Uh, howling is a way for us to have groups let the wolves know that they have new visitors here. Um, so uh, there's actually a movement called Relist Wolves, which is trying to grant protections back for wolves in Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And if you visit relistwolves.org or just visit any of our social platforms, we always redirect to that. Um, but it's contacting the Secretary of the Interior, uh, Secretary Deb Holland, asking her to reinstate protections for wolves to stop those hunts. Um, that's a great way to help wolves. Um, and always reaching out to uh, whether it's elected officials or state wildlife agencies, just letting them know you like wolves and support wolves, that goes a long way as well. Many states are entering kind of this period of time where they're drafting new wolf, uh, what they call management plans. Um, and so those are always really good opportunities to come in as well. So a lot of great ways to support wolves, um, but really using your voice is the most powerful. So. All right. Great. Very cool. Okay. Um, so I'm going to close up the stream here. Do you guys have anything else that you want to share? with everybody no just thank you all so much for joining thank you uh, once again for your support and if you want additional information feel free to visit us on any of our social channels or our website a lot of great ways to continue to learn about wolves also all of the wolves here we have our live streaming webcams running constantly on our twitch channel but also on our website as well so you can always see these wolves uh, but thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully everyone learned something new which is great great all right thank you so much yeah. i can meet you guys down awesome there and, and in case your group comes up feel free to wander wherever okay. you want okay <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, chatters. Let's see. Um, oh my gosh. Crowned Eye <laughs> just like last minute donated $1,111.11. And Axial tipped $100 exclusive with $117. I'll go ahead and like squat here so you can see them behind me. Um, Zale with five dollars and Hid with twenty. Uh, that brings us to six thousand seven hundred and thirty-one dollars and forty-six cents. Uh, that is crazy, you guys. I, I don't know. I don't recall how much we raised. You know, th like ugh. we raised a lot through Conservation Uncharted. Um, how much was it through Uncharted? Like eighty. 
or something, between sixty and eighty thousand dollars for conservation related causes, um, and through Conservation Uncharted, uh, we've raised tens of thousands as well. Um, so, thank you so much for contributing to that. These are all nonprofit organizations that can use it to take care of these animals. So, uh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna run some polls uh, to see because I saw you guys all taking notes this whole time. Um, so I want to see how good your notes are. Um, we're gonna run some polls and then that'll be the end of the stream. Um, our space is gonna run some polls. And I'm gonna read them to you. Don't look at my notebook. That's cheating. Don't look it. Okay. The answers are in here. Okay, poll number one. Question number one. This is a test. This is a test. Question number one. How many teeth do wolves have? I'm gonna be honest, we didn't talk about this during the- There are a couple of these questions that we did talk about during the stream, some that we didn't. Is it A, 25 teeth, B, 32 teeth, C, 42 teeth, or D, 52 teeth? What do you think, what do you think, what do you think? <clears throat> a lot of people typing C. A lot of people typing C. Space, let me know when it's done. Oh my god, kids are coming. 77% C. 77% said C, and the correct answer is C. Well done. 42 teeth. Wolves have 42 teeth. Um, nice. Alright, ready? Question number two. How strong is the bite of a gray wolf? Is it A, 100 to 400 pounds per square inch, PSI? B, 400 to 1200 PSI? C, 1200 to 1500 PSI? Or D, 1,500 to 2,000 PSI. Hi. I see lots of mixed answers on this one. Okay, there are a bunch of kids. I'm gonna run away. All right, we're just gonna go up here a little bit. Okay. We'll just, we'll just stand up here. All right, um. Okay, 64, uh, B. 64% of you said B, the correct answer is B. 400 to 1200 PSI. Um, well done, okay? You guys are doing better than I thought. Uh, question number three, how much does the largest wolf ever recorded weigh? We did talk about weights a little bit. Um, up there, the smallest wolf that got a health check this morning was about 40 pounds, I think. Um, is it A, 64 pounds, B, 87 pounds, C, 120 pounds, or D, 176 pounds? It's cold as heck right now. Okay. I love New York. 82D. 82% said D, okay. Did you, are you cheating? Did you look at my notebook? You looked in you, at my notebook. The correct answer is D, 176 pounds. Poll number four. Number four. How fast can a wolf run? A, 22 miles per hour, B, 35 miles per hour, C, 45 miles per hour, or D, 50 miles per hour? Should we go further? Sure. Go further. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Saved. Okay. Alright, what you got? I see a lot of C's. 72C. 72% said C. 72% of you are wrong. The correct answer is B. It's 35 miles per hour. Um, wolves, from what I read, are known to be able to run long distances, like at a lope, like running for a long time. Uh, but for sprints, not so much. Um, <laughs> uh, question number five, this is the last quiz question. This is your last chance to redeem yourselves if you just got the last one wrong. Uh, what is the gestation period for wolves? This was actually set on stream, so if you're paying attention, you should know. Was it A, 63 days, B, 70 days, C, 90 days, or D, 120 days? and like clap like this so they have to listen to the educator and I'm like talking over everybody.
All right, what do we got? Eighty-eight A. Okay. Um. Eighty-eight percent of you said A. Sixty-three days. You were correct. Good listening. She did say that. Regan did say that while we were walking around. I was like, that's a poll question. All right. Amazing. How many of you got 100%? Raise your hand. Frick. Four out of five. Easy. Four out of five. Okay, lots of you are raising your hands. Four out of five. A bunch of you, four out of five. That's, that's not bad. That is pretty good. Axial Mars with $200. Yo 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 with six hundred and six dollars, T Chark with fifty six dollars, Jester with five dollars, Swifty with twenty dollars. Hello, that's a seven thousand dollars. That's why we hit that seven k mark, <laughs> guys. Thank you so much for your donations today. Again, all of these donations are going straight into uh, Wolf Conservation Center. Their PayPal is hooked up to mine today. So if you've donated to me, you're donating to them as if you're donating through their website. Um, so thank you so much uh, for doing that. I'm glad you guys liked it. I'm glad you guys got to see some behind the scenes stuff. Um, I do want to note at the beginning of the stream, Regan did a fantastic job at explaining it. Um, this center is very different from Alveus. Uh, in purpose. You know, you see Alveus, we have educational ambassadors um, and we have non-releasable educational ambassadors. So a lot of the husbandry we do and a lot of the vet stuff that we do, um, health checks, things like that, we do a lot of voluntary training, right? So we want those animals to work with us and we want them to be very comfortable with us. Um, this place is, is the opposite and that the animals that they have are release candidates, right? And Regan talked about how wolves in the wild, their biggest threat is humans. Their biggest threat is being hit by cars. They don't want them to be comfortable around humans at all. Uh, and that's for their best interest, you know, if they're going to be released into the wild. So that's why their health checks look very different from the ones at my facility, um, because they want them to be afraid of humans uh, so that they have a better chance at surviving in the wild. Uh, I saw a lot of people confused at the beginning of the stream about what was going on. That's what was going on. Um, so that's why it's different from what we do at Alveus, but I hope that that makes sense to you guys. They do an excellent job here. Um, they're just a fantastic example for lots of facilities. Um, this red wolf is gonna check us out. Um, they're an excellent example uh, for, for how to take care of these animals. Um, I'll note again, one of the reasons that I wanted to do this stream right now is because this center is one of the three largest in North America for saving um, saving these these wolf species, this red wolf behind us uh, that you're looking at right now. Um, there are only 10 recorded individuals in the wild. Um, so this is a critically endangered species that is absolutely dependent on facilities like this uh, to keep them from going extinct. Both red wolves and Mexican gray wolves have been declared as extinct in the wild in the past, uh, and they're quite literally bringing them back and saving them from extinction. So this facility is just massively important. Um, and it means, this is so cool. <laughs> um, and it, it means a ton that they let me come here um, and be part of, of such a cool program um, that's just so important for conservation. Um, so this means the world to me. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, thank you so much for donating. This was a fantastic episode, and I'm sorry we only had one backpack issue. True, two. We're really moving up in the world. Um, so, very cool. Uh, I did this whole speech on my last stream. I'm super, super glad to be back uh, so that I can do conservation work and so that I can use my platform to highlight organizations like this. That is such a gift uh, to me, and I'm, I'm so lucky to be able to do that uh, for for places like this. So thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, going forward right now, uh, it is almost Thanksgiving time. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I'm going home to see my family, so I won't be live until I come back uh, from California visiting my family. So this will be the, the last stream for a bit um, until I get back. But all the Alveus cams uh, will be live. Uh, they have 
there are 24 seven cams. There was a, um, huh? there was a millipede cam last night. If you guys saw it, Hank the Tank was out and about eating zucchini. Uh, he loves the nightlife. So uh, you can check him out. They almost got a hat on him last night, I heard. <laughs> so you can go check out the live cams right now. Alex, uh, Alex the intern is about to, is about to run it back for Alveus. Um, he's really putting in the work today. Um, thank you again for watching. I will see you guys after Thanksgiving. I hope you have an excellent holiday. Um, and I hope you learned a lot today. Uh, go follow Wolf Conservation Center on Twitch and Instagram and Twitter. Their YouTube pops off, like pops off. Um, they do really well on there. Uh, so you should go, go follow them on those, check out their live cams. Uh, and if you liked any of the merch that you saw on the staff, they have merch on their websites. They also have Christmas sweaters. If you want a wolf Christmas sweater, uh, you can you can get one from Wolf Conservation Center from their website. Thank you guys for linking. Thank you so much for watching. Go check out Alvaez's channel. I will see you later. I haven't told <laughs> that I need to start the raid, so now I have to stall again. Um, do do. Am I forgetting anything? Is it raining? Is it? It glitches on mobile, I can't see it. Chat, tell me. Yes, it's raining. <laughs> it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining. Let me make sure that I have everything. Yes, okay. Oh, also, I didn't know. Um, Wolf Conservation Center on their website, uh, they have a map of the U.S. and it's a it's a wolf legislation map. So you can click on your state and see what legislation is enacted or is uh, in your state that has to do with wolves. And you can see like where it's at and if it's been signed off or, or if it's you know whatever. Um, so if you want to learn more about legislation for wolves in your state and what you can do about it, you can find that on their website. Uh, it's a really cool feature. So you can go check that out. Um, Legislation is really important for conservation. Advocacy is really important for conservation, not just from uh, legislators, but from you guys as well. So thank you so much. I will see you guys after Thanksgiving. And LUD's charity stream starts today. Go watch LUD. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, while the rake gears up, you can just shoot them. I know. Did you research the